It's with great pleasure that I take to introduce our speaker tonight, Marie Stolte. Um, Marie was my mentor when I was an intern, and she has subsequently um, joined, become the secretary of the leadership team. She is um, teaching us all about jumping worms. And today, Marie is um, going to talk about seed starting indoors. So thank you, Marie, for all the time and talent and energy that you've given to the group. And I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say tonight. Thanks, Jean. Appreciate it. I got interested in this topic about five years ago. Um, and I'm hoping that even though I'm quite sure that a lot of you know more about this topic than I do, that there might be something in here that would be of interest to just about everybody. So tonight we're gonna to talk about why start seeds indoors. Um, and once you do decide to do it, what you have to think about and consider before you start. Um, we'll talk about other things that can make the job a lot easier. We'll look at some sample setups, and then we'll review some top seed starting tips for success. So first of all, why would you even want to start seeds indoors? Um, probably the best reason is if your garden is like mine, you've still got spots to fill, and you can always find another spot to put another plant. So when you can plant seeds, you can do uh, gardening a lot more cost effectively than buying plants. It also allows you to grow varieties that you can buy from seed companies, um, and that goes well beyond what you'll be able to find in a local nursery. You can expand your understanding of germination, and most of all, it's just fun to do in the off season. Um, right now I have a room full of seedlings and cuttings, and it's going to get me, I'm quite sure, through the winter season. So when you start to think about um, seed starting indoors, um, there are a lot of different directions you could approach it from. Um, you could approach it from the lights, just start with the lights and the shelving, and you know all of that. But I think from this presentation standpoint, it helps to think about what your goals are going to be. What are you actually trying to do by starting seeds indoors? Are you trying to do a prairie restoration, plant a rain garden, grow vegetables? Um, it helps to sort of start with the seeds so we'll figure out how many plants you want to grow, how many seeds you'll need to get those plants, because I'm pretty sure that you're not going to get 100% germination. Um, find out about the seeds and what they need to break dormancy. And then working backwards, when do you need to plant those seeds? Then you can move into the, the kind of the infrastructure type things like trays, soil, shelving, lights, temperature, and water. So let's start with how many plants you want. Um, when you're first starting out, first of all, you probably want to be um, economical. Start with a reasonable expectation of what you can achieve and expect to learn every year from then on. Um, for the purposes of this discussion and to, to illustrate some of the things you'll need to think about, we're going to pretend that we're going to uh, plant a rain garden along a boulevard. We're going to plant some peppers and we're also going to plant some tomato plants because we like to eat them right off the vine. To figure out how many plants you want, you probably for a rain garden are going to need a plant. Um, depending on the size of your plot, these 10 plants might make up the plants in your rain garden. And these actually came from the Prairie Moon Nursery website, which is, if you haven't discovered it yet, is a fabulous site for learning more about native plants. So we're going to assume that we're going to have a rain garden that has 10 types of plants, and we're going to have 10 each 
of those 10 plants, which will give us a total of 100 plants. Then in terms of peppers, um, you're going to grow poblano peppers because you love to make chili rellenos and you also want to be able to dry them to keep ancho pepper powder for your cooking. In addition, we'll have three tomato or cherry tomato plants. So between the rain garden, the peppers and the tomatoes, we're talking about 112 plants. So if you wanna have 112 plants, how many seeds do you need? You know, as we talked about earlier, you're probably not going to get 100% germination. Um, when you buy seeds, sometimes the package will tell you the percent germination. Um, in the upper right picture there, you can see some of the seeds that we've ordered for the greenhouse crew, um, tomatoes and peppers for this year. And Johnny's seeds does actually give the percentage, which are highlighted in orange. Um, but if you don't know what the germination percent is, you can still figure out an approximate germination percentage from um, by doing a germination test. And to do it, it's pretty simple. You take a paper towel or a coffee filter and you moisten it. You count out 10 seeds onto the filter. You fold the paper over the seeds, making sure that the seeds aren't touching put it in a plastic bag and throw it up on top of the refrigerator. Then every two to three days after you've put them in this plastic baggie, check the seeds and then every day after that, watching for germination. Um, you can calculate the germination percentage by taking the number of seeds that actually germinate divided by the 10 seeds you tested. So if you have eight seeds that germinated, divide that by 10 and you have an 80% germination rate. You can use the same uh, strategy, the germination test. It works really well whether you are using an old seed packet or if you have brought in some of your own seeds from your garden. So, for those 112 plants that we want, we're going to assume that all those plants had an 80% germination rate. So to get the number of seeds you have to plant, you take the number of plants you want, divide it by the germination percentage, and then you'll know how many seeds you need to plant. And I won't go through the math here with you, but I've, I've illustrated it here on the screen so that you can see between the rain garden, the peppers, and the tomatoes, you're going to need to sow about 146 seeds to get the plants you want. The next thing to do is to see what each seed needs to break dormancy. You can get some of this information if you have them in a seed packet, but again, if you brought in seeds from outdoors, or you may have seeds that were separated or were given to you from their packet, um, you need to know that seed coats are impermeable to moisture and oxygen. And that's because plants have biological strategies so that when the, they drop their seeds, they're gonna germinate when they're supposed to. So they fall in the summer, the rain wets them, and gradually over the winter, the cold breaks them down a little more, it rains in the spring, and the seed coat inhibitors are washed away so that when it warms up, the seeds will germinate. Indoors, you have to mimic that so that you can break the dormancy and allow the seeds to germinate. There's a couple means to do this, and you may have to do some research with the seeds you have, particularly if you don't have a seed packet that explains a lot about what the seed is going to need. For instance, in our rain garden, one of the, one of the plants we're looking at is red milkweed. Um, red milkweed needs what's called cold moist stratification. And to do that, you put um, some sand in a baggie, you moisten it, drop the seeds in, and you put it in your refrigerator for a specific number of days. 
plants again have different numbers of days that they need this treatment. Um, for red milkweed, it's 30 days. Then after that 30 day period, you plant. Um, another type of treatment that seeds might need is called scarification. Scarification basically means you're going to nick the seed coat just enough to let water in. Um, it happens that the blue wild indigo that we have in our rain garden needs both scarification and then the cold moist treatment for 10 days before it's planted. So by doing your research, you would know about this in advance. There's yet another treatment method um, that some seeds need. For instance, if you have warm season prairie grasses, they need something called dry stratification which means they need a period where the seeds are dry, they may be in an envelope, but you have to put that in a cold area for a certain number of days. Um, they may need to be in there anywhere from 30 to 60 days, for example, for the grasses. Um, and that gives them the treatment that they need to break dormancy. Even peppers will have some requirements to break dormancy. Um, I talked to Mark Battistini in our, um, on our greenhouse crew about pepper requirements because he knows quite a lot about this. And he's told me that peppers really like heat to germinate. So we use heating mats in the greenhouse for those seeds. They get um, the best results when the seeds are between 80 to 90 degrees while they're still germinating. And interestingly, um, the hotter the pepper is, the longer and slower the germination can be. So even though peppers will germinate without a heating mat, they will do so more reliably if you do heat them. The other thing, um, Mark made sure to tell me, and what I thought was interesting was, you have to be patient, and that holds true with all types of seeds. Your packet may say the seeds will emerge within seven to 14 days, but it's very possible that it may take longer or less time, depending on the actual conditions in the room where these seeds are sown. Um, even when you have seeds from the same packet, sown at the same time in the same flat, you may find that they germinate weeks apart. So be patient with whatever you put in your seed trays. The next thing with seeds to think about is when you need to plant each one. And what I typically do um, is I develop a calendar for myself for all the different seeds I'm going to be planting. I look at the package, if I have it, and for our poblano peppers, it says that we need to plant those eight weeks before we're going to transplant them outside. And since May 11th is our last estimated frost date, you count backwards, which um, brings us to March 23rd for your planting date for the poblano peppers. So once you've figured out for your seeds when all of them have to be planted, um, you have to decide on a few other things, starting with trays. Um, you can use a lot of different types of things to start seed. You can buy the seed starter kits at um, the hardware store. You can do them in flats. Um, you could even put them in takeout containers or yogurt, con yogurt containers. Um, lots of things work as long as they have holes for drainage. Um, but what you need to think about when you get seed trays is the fact that if you get seed trays that have very small cells, they're one inch across, say, you probably are going to need to transplant those seedlings at least once before you can transplant them outside. It's important to think about that, especially when you come to your shelving and your lights, because if you planted, say, the tray in the bottom right-hand corner of this of the pictures here, that has that holds 40. Well, the the tray cells are only about an inch and a half across, 
And by the time those have to be moved up to the next size pot, you're gonna need twice as much space and twice as many lights. So that's just something to consider. You should also remember that whatever you decide to plant in should have a cover for it so that when the seeds are sown in the trays, they will have a little dome above them that acts like a little greenhouse. Um, and you would take that plastic off the tray as the seedlings emerge. In terms of soil, pretty straightforward. Um, don't use garden soil. Garden soil has um, fungus and bacteria in it that can quickly kill young seedlings. Your best bet is to start with a seed starter mix, um, jiffy seed pellets, which you see on the bottom there, um, or a homemade mix that contains no garden soil, such as a combination of a gallon each of peat moss, vermiculite, and perlite. The um, reason that you start with seed starter is not only because it does not have the bacteria that will kill the seedlings, but because the, um, the seedlings will have the room and the air that they need to be able to push up above the soil and push down so that their roots can grow. In terms of shelving, just about anything works. Um, what you see in this picture is Nancy Schumacher, who is a commercial native plant grower. She lives between Hampton and, Ra and Randolph, and her husband built her these shelves. One thing that uh, Nancy had seen in using just regular shelving is that she could lay a seed tray lengthwise across the shelf, but once she tried to, to turn it sideways so that the width would be toward the front of the shelf, she couldn't fit more than three of those standard trays on a shelf. So her husband built her these so that she can now fit four of the standard seed trays across the shelf and that all of the, the seedlings in those trays have a light above them. This seems to work for her um, and it actually was pretty ingenious. So shelves, first of all, need to be functional. You want it to be able to fit your trays on the shelves the way you want them. You also have to be sure that you can attach lights to the shelving so that you can raise and lower them as the plants are growing. And you can also plan for transplanting um, on those shelves. For instance, the four trays that Nancy can fit on one shelf when she pots those up, it will be twice as many plants, which means twice as many trays, and she has another shelf below the first one to be able to accommodate all those transplanted cells. She also supplements with natural light, um, and she's told me that even with the lights on, the, the, su the supplemental light will um, the seedlings grow toward that supplemental light on a cloudy day, even with the lights on. So if you have natural light, um, do try to utilize it because it will help your seedlings be stronger. I think lights are probably one of the most confusing things for people who are starting out with an indoor seed starting setup. Um, there are three characteristics of light, just to make it simple. The quantity of light, which means how intense it is. The quality of light, which refers to the wavelength at the plant's surface. And the duration of light, the amount of time that the plant will be exposed to sunlight. In terms of the quantity of light, um, you can solve for this indoors um, by being able to raise your lights to always be an inch or two above the plants. And as the plants grow, you can raise the lights to, till they are just one to two inches above the plants. In terms of quality of light, 
the main thing to remember is that plants grow best when they have red and blue spectrum light. You can get those wavelengths of light in, a, in many ways. Incandescent lights do not work because they don't have these wavelengths, but LED grow lights will work. Um, fluorescent shop lights will work. If you get a shop light and you fit it with two grow lights, which are also known as plant and aquarium lights, or you can do two 40 watt fluorescent bulbs, one warm white, which would give you the red spectrum, and one cool white for the blue spectrum, or take your shop light and put in two daylight fluorescent bulbs, which are full spectrum light. The reason that the daylight fluorescent will work is because it's a total spectrum light, meaning it goes all the way through the cool to the warm. And it does have both the red and the blue that the plants want and other light spectrums that they don't care about. They still work. And in fact, if you look at the selections of light under quality of light from LED down to the flore daylight fluorescent bulbs, um, you can pretty well assume that that goes from most expensive to least expensive. It can be done for a lot less money if you don't mind working with shop lights. The duration of light, um, really all you need to know is um, according to the U of M, Seedlings need about 14 to 16 hours a day for, um, to grow at their best. You can use a timer to start and stop the light so you don't have to be running back and forth and checking on them or getting up at four o'clock in the morning or anything crazy like that. All you have to do is set the timer and they'll do the work for you. Now, in addition to that, as we talked about earlier with the peppers, you may have some special temperature requirements for germination. Um, some seeds like warmer rooms, for instance, in the 70 to 75 degree range. My downstairs, which is where I have my light set up, is probably between, I would say, 60 degrees and 70 degrees. It doesn't mean I can't germinate seedlings downstairs. It just means they're a little slower if the, if the seeds need a 75 degree temperature. Again, read your seed packets well in advance and you'll be well prepared for whatever is to come. The next thing you'll need to think about is water. Make sure you have water near your shelves, which sounds pretty obvious, but when you have a lot of seedlings, um, it's an easy thing to forget about. And especially if like me, you have um, softened water. We happen to have a water softener, but our cold water in the kitchen bypasses it. So I can use my tap water as long as it's cold and bring it down into the basement where my plants are. And I'll tell you, I get my steps in going up and down the stairs because I don't have a closer water source. Um, but make sure you have a water source nearby. Um, when you get ready to plant, you want to pre-moisten the soil so the seeds don't get disturbed by water after you plant the seed. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more during, we, there's a slide on tomatoes that we'll talk about in a minute. Um, then once the seedlings emerge, bottom water or mist the seedlings to water them. That way you won't dislodge them, especially when they haven't had much time to establish a root system. And also, just a reminder, don't overwater. The soil should feel cool or slightly damp about one half inch down. Um, overwatering is one of the easiest ways to kill seedlings, and I can attest to that. Okay, here we are on the, on the tomato seeds. I got these um, recommendations from Ginny Berkepeck, who is also in our greenhouse crew and has a lot of experience with tomatoes. She advised um, to start when the package says, which I totally agree with that. 
And according to the packet that I have for my cherry tomatoes, it says four to six weeks before the last average frost date. Um, don't plant tomatoes too soon. If your package says four to six weeks, that is the ideal time before those plants will be put out into the garden. Um, if you plant them too soon, the tomatoes are going to be very spindly and weak and will likely not even catch up. Even if you planted, if you did plant another set four to six weeks before the last frost date, those would likely be healthier and stronger than the ones you planted earlier. Um, it's a good idea to create your labels before you sow. Um, I can attest to this because the first year I planted, I had rows of um, tomato, pepper, and, and then I had several flower types that I was planting. And I thought I was being careful. Um, but when you put the plant seeds in at the right depth, you can get distracted with what you already have planted and what has not been planted. If you create the plant labels first and put them in the cells before you sow, um, you're going to not forget that crucial step and be confused when you've rotated your trays and forget what you planted. Um, until you recognize what a plant is, or you may have a full flat of different types of tomatoes, you're not going to know which one of those is the cherry tomato if you don't mark them. Then, as we talked about before, moisten your seed starting mix to the dampness of a wet sponge, which means not dripping wet, but just enough so that when you squeeze the dirt in your hand, it holds together and it doesn't fall apart. And then you do that before you fill the cells. Fill the cells about three quarter full, compact the seed starting mix gently, and then you look at your seed package again to figure out what is the planting depth? Is it a quarter inch? Is it a half inch? Is it an inch? Use a seed dibbler or a pencil or some popsicle stick or something for consistent planting depth. It's very important that the seeds not be planted too deep or too shallowly so that they can't get the right, right amount of sun or the right amount of dirt over them so that they have a de decent root system. You drop the seeds in and you cover them. And then you water only as needed. Um, sometimes if it's a cloudy day, your seedlings may not even need to be watered. Check them by putting your finger in about a half inch and it should feel cool and moist, but not wet. Um, again, over or under watering are the best ways to kill seedlings. There are some things that can also add to your setup if you decide to use them. Um, if you're growing a lot of peppers, for instance, it might be worth it to you to not only have a heating pad, but to use a thermostat with a probe that you put into the dirt to make sure that the temperature stays where you want it. Um, a fan is very useful once the seedlings start to emerge. Keeping good air circulation helps prevent diseases for seedlings and it makes their uh, stems stronger before they're put outside. Um, these other things include a water bottle, a seed dibbler, or a timer. Those things are all good to have. Now we're going to look at um, a few seed starting setups. So Hi, I'm Dr. Jim Lakin. Uh, I've been a master gardener now for about four years, although I've been gardening for about 40 years. Uh, around five or six years ago, I started to uh, develop an interest in uh, growing plants from seeds. And, you know, started initially with uh, a few flats in the uh, kitchen window and uh, had limited success. Uh, about three years ago, I decided I was going to go whole hog and uh, see what I could accomplish, especially uh, trying to germinate some of the more demanding uh, native perennials. And uh, this is what we ended up with. Okay, the, well, the first thing we started with was the, uh, the germination cabinet. 
And uh, this I made out in the in the workshop, just using two by fours insulation. Put uh, some plastic sheeting down here since the lower area is obviously getting a lot of water, and use some plexiglass to cover the front so you can keep an eye on what's going on there. Um, Actually, totaling it all, it uh, was about four five hundred dollars in material by the time we got the lights, uh, the heating uh, there, and of course the thermostatically controlled heating pads. Uh, the lights, of course, are on timers also. Uh, but uh, it, you know, if, if you got a warm area in the house, uh, you can do it for a whole heck of a lot less money. But uh, since uh, we were using a garage area and. Uh, I was having fun. I perhaps spent a little bit more money than was absolutely necessary. <laughs> um, I'm Paulette Black. I've been a master gardener for, well, I was an intern for a year. Now I guess I'm a master gardener, learning all the time. Being with the lights, a grow light system, and I was given this um, by another gardener who had used it and worked with it and was done with it. So I was lucky enough to be the recipient of this. Um, I started gardening and doing plants upstairs in the sunroom, um, growing uh, sunflowers and some of the spider plants, coleus. Um, so now I have this system, and which I've never had before. This is the bulb for the, um, the plant stand and it's a fluorescent bulb and it's four growing plants so yeah I'm Marie Stolte and I've been a master gardener since 2019 and or actually an intern but whatever anyway I'm a master gardener and um, this is my indoor seed starting setup which um, since it's the off season these are actually all of the annual plants that I take outside in the summer and bring back in the winter, and some cuttings and things that I'm kind of playing with. Um, I started my seed starting with one of these IKEA shelves that was just repurposed. We had used it downstairs in the basement for something, and I bought two of the four bulb LEDs um, and I grow, it's a perfect size for a seed tray. So the seedlings start quite nicely here. Um, I've grown, these are some uh, coneflowers that mistakenly propag propagated before they were supposed to, and so I brought them indoors this fall. Um, and I also have some sedum that I'm trying, it's a normally an outdoor sedum, they live outdoors all winter, but I brought them in just for something a little different to look at. Um, this is how I started with just these two sets of lights and a tray of seedlings. Um, unfortunately, this setup doesn't work the best once the seeds get a little larger because this, the distance between these shelves is not very great. And so what, that's one of the things I regretted about it. I'm Janice Gessner and I've been a Dakota County Master Gardener for about 11 years. And uh, all during those years, I've started plants on my own at home. And my husband, Bob, here uh, uh, is the one who created the, my little setup so that we can grow those plants starting anytime we want. So if you add up all the costs, current costs, the rack, the light fixtures, and the SO chains, um, the power strip, the timer, and 12 bulbs, Full cost would be about $350 if you were to buy it now. My name is Robert Hatlevig and I'm a Minnesota Extension Master Gardener from Dakota County. And this is my propagation system. I set up my system in the laundry room so I could hang the lights from the floor joists. You can probably see um, the chains and the S hooks. This is so I can raise and lower the lights as needed. I also used a car reflective shield to line the walls. This helps the light to be reflected back onto the plants. 
I haven't planted any native seeds yet, but I'm ready to do it any day now. I have round four inch pots, square four inch pots, and five inch tubes. The tubes I'm experimenting with for the native plants because native plants grow um, tremendously long roots and in a shorter pot they get root bound. This year is the first year that I've started to use lights to grow plants inside. Before that, I did winter sowing. And winter sowing is when you use a container similar to this. This happens to be a mixed lettuce container. And I clean it out, put in four to five inches of soil, put native seeds on the top, and put it out into the snow. I put the lid on it. It acts like a little greenhouse, but not much happens for the first um, couple of months. The seeds go through the process called stratification, and sometime in the spring, probably late spring, they start to sprout. The only problem with winter sowing is that you get very small plants um, by the end of May and um, probably too small to sell in a, in a garden sale. So that's why I'm planting some under lights this year. I just thought I'd go over a couple of the things that you may or may not have been able to hear during the video. Um, Jim, his garage setup, um, when the door is closed, it stays about 30 degrees. But with that cabinet, the seeds are kept um, sometime between 70 and 90 degrees within that cabinet. Um, he has two sets, actually four sets of lights. Um, they're full spectrum LEDs and they plug into each other. So it, it enables you to have lights that, um, that link. And he also has several fans in there um, to run 24 seven so that there's good air circulation for those little seedlings. Janice Gessner set up, she had a six foot tall shelf um, each of the shelves is four feet long and 18 inches deep. Um, she has those, each shelf has got two four foot shop lights that are held with chains and S hooks. And she uses the daylight bulbs, which are only about $3 per bulb, less expensive than grow lights. Um, they are all plugged into a power strip and a lamp timer. And she keeps the lights on for 18 hours a day. Paulette Black has a setup um, that has three fluorescent shop lights. They've got grow lights in them from Lowe's. Um, you can also find the fluorescent bulbs at Menards. Um, and I believe Home Depot has them too. And she has ample tray space for six flats. She, right now, she just has her house plants on them, but soon. Because the cart is on wheels, she'll be able to roll it around the corner and use it for seedlings. Robert had um, his laundry room, um, has got the chains and S hooks hanging from the floor joists up above so that he can raise and lower lights. He uses a car reflective shield to reflect light back to the plants. And I wanted to point out again those small um, tubes in the back, the five inch tubes. Um, native plants have notoriously long roots. And so that will give them a great start before they have to be planted outdoors. My downstairs setup, um, repurposed shelves. Um, I'm kind of a, a fluorescent I, I use the um, fluorescent grow lights in my setup. Um, I have chains again that raise and lower um, and 
The fan and lights are on timers and I use boot trays to keep my floor dry because this was an old bedroom. So I'm gonna talk through a few things that, that we may have touched on, but um, these are the top 10 things I came up with for successful seed starting. First of all, plan your seed purchases. And now is a great time to do that. Um, you can get great selection if you go to online catalogs or if you buy from Johnny Select Seeds or the Hudson Valley Seed Company or other um, reputable growers to get lots of different selection and you can do less impulse spending at Menards. Sterilize all the containers, no matter what kind they are before you use them. If you have a brand new Jiffy tray with a um, built-in cover, you don't have to sterilize that, but um, sterilizing is not difficult. You take the containers, scrub off all the dirt you can, um, and use a one part bleach to nine parts water um, in, a, in a bucket. Just leave the containers in there for about 15 to 20 minutes before you use them. Rinse them off well and you're ready to go. Um, wet seed starter before you sow the seeds, because again, then you won't have to water the seeds right after you plant them. Um, the picture shows what seed starter mix looks like when it has enough water to be what we call moist. Um, it's not dripping wet, but it holds together when you squeeze it in your palm. Add natural light where possible and rotate trays because it will help your plants be stronger. And a good idea is to set up your shelves and lights where you'll see them every day, especially when you're growing seeds because um, you will need to check them daily to make sure that they don't need water or to see whether there's any sign of disease because you wanna catch that early. So it's much more convenient. Um, Jim Lakin's um, setup, for instance, is right outside this kitchen door. You can go right out into the garage and the cabinet is right there and you can see what's going on. You have to be ruthless if you find seedlings that are diseased. There is a, um, a fungus called damping off disease and you'll know you have it if all of a sudden seedlings that were growing start to wither, they just fall over or the the base of the seedling where it touches the soil gets black and then it falls over. Um, once you see that, if it has damping off disease and if it's in a tray, that disease passes through soil and it will go through a flat of seedlings like wildfire. So if you see a disease seedling, get it out of there, keep your eye out for disease in any of the cells around the one you removed and pull those out too. If you have a lot of trouble with it, you may need to get some fungicide to put on the soil. But if you're doing vegetables, be, be careful of that because this is something you're going to be eating. Um, but at any rate, keep your eye out for disease seedlings. When the seedlings have two sets of true leaves, you want to transplant them. And when you see the, the little plant in this picture here, the two leaves that come out are not true leaves. Those are the cotyledons. Those are essentially their food for the seed until it has grown roots and grown its true leaves. So the true leaves will come out above these two little cotyledon seeds. Um, when you have two sets of true leaves, that's the transplant time. If you have unused seeds in a packet, save them. There's nothing that says that tomatoes seeds that you bought that were good for planting in 2022 won't last for another two or three years or sometimes longer. Um, use a germination test if you're not sure what they are. Just bend over the top of the packet, uh, seal it with tape and put it somewhere dark and cool and um, try them again in the spring, the following spring, you'll be able to save yourself some money that way. 
be sure to harden off all your plants before putting them out in the garden. Um, most people know that when you buy or bring out anything that's been started indoors, no matter how strong they are, they are not used to full sun and they are not used to wind. They have to get used to that before you put them in the garden or they will die. So to harden off, you put them out for an hour or two at a time over a period of about two weeks, adding to the time every day um, until the plants can be outside full time. And the number 10 tip for successful seed starting is if you're not sure you want to invest in seed starting, but you do want to try to do it, um, try before you buy. Um, we've been talking with Dakota County Natural Resources and the Mississippi Park Connection, and they've created a program called Seedsters that puts um, people in touch with planting native seeds at home um, for nothing. They provide training. They provide a loaner kit with grow light, the plant seeds, the trays, the soil, everything you need to start the seedlings at home. About six weeks after the February 1 training, you return the grow kit and you bring your seedlings to the Dakota County Natural Resources hoop house, which is like a greenhouse, only with plastic walls instead of glass. Um, and anything that we grow um, in this seed starter class, the native plants are going to be used for prairie restoration in Lebanon Hills. So if you want to try it, um, they are holding a special session for Dakota County Master Gardeners, limited to 20 people. And Sally McNamara is going to send her follow-up email with a link for you to register for that class. And I'd encourage you, if you're interested, to do it quickly because the classes fill up quickly and the deadline for registering is January 26th. The other thing you can do um, if you do decide to go ahead and to invest in lights and shelving um, is to join our at-home plant propagation team. These eight people, including me, I'm not on that list, but I am one of the people on the team, um, have agreed to plant one to two flats of seeds for the plant sale in our homes. Um, we're going to learn how to grow seeds. There are veterans among us, and there are also people who are completely new at doing this. Um, and so if you would like to learn to do the ins and outs of growing seeds, we furnish the seeds, but you would furnish the lights, the shelving, the soil, and um, the care until the plant sale. So if you're interested in trying that, um, please contact me or MB Kufrin by January 10th, which is when we're going to meet to talk about who's going to plant what. And finally, last but not least, thank you to everybody who helped me with this presentation. Um, I couldn't have done it without the help of all of these people who were really generous with their time and their knowledge. And that's what I find master gardeners are famous for. So I hope you've enjoyed the presentation. And if there isn't time to answer questions, I'm not even sure how much time we have left. Um, I can try to capture what's in the chat and, um, and I can write to you after the, the meeting. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. So what you, Marie, you just said you're going to go through the, the, the chat and see if there's questions you want to answer. I can do that for you. Oh, that would be great. That would be of great. Of course. Um, there are a few questions. There are lots of comments. The first one is MB put a note in that there is a link um, that you can go to um, the hub and find this presentation, which is probably the best thing everybody needs to know. Um, there are a lot of comments in here. Um, one of the questions that wasn't answered um, in the presentation, because I think most of them were, is do you maintain the heat mat on the peppers and tomatoes after they've germinated? Um, I'm not sure if Mark or Ginny is there. Um, 
I can tell you that once mine have germinated, or most of them, I should say, have germinated because as we talked about, they can actually germinate at different times. But um, I wait for most of them to germinate before disconnecting the feed. Okay. Um, there was a question about why the refrigerator. And I think I think the obvious question is because of the heat, but do you want to comment on that one? Why the refrigerator? Yes. Why do you put your um, seedlings up there? Oh, oh. Um, no, uh, the, when you're talking about um, the germination test, mm -hmm. that's what you're talking about. You yes. put it on top of the refrigerator because it's warm up there. Okay. So if you would have another warm place that would work as well, you can also use someplace else. That's just one that was suggested. Okay. Um, I think all the other questions that were, an, um, were asked were answered. Um, one of the question was um, to Robert about what did you use for your um, tubes for your natives and it was PVC pipe. Um, and Tori Clark made a, a comment that um, LED bars work well, they're lightweight and making them easier to adjust and lower the profile so you get by with less space between shelves. That's great. Awesome really important. Thanks, thanks, Tori. That's very good to know. Um, other than that, I think uh, the other questions were, were really pretty much addressed in the um, in your discussion. Um, I have Kay shoot mentioned sprinkling clove seasoning um, to, to prevent damping off. Has anyone ever heard of that? I was struck by that. I have not heard of that, but that is something that I wouldn't mind trying. I uh, can tell you, I was living in New Hampshire. This was many decades ago. Um, and we had a community garden there. Uh, and the University of New Hampshire vegetable expert um, came out and observed our uh, community garden often. And he was the one that was telling me about this. He said, after you get them planted, he's, I can't remember, it's been so many years, but there is a chemical compound that is given off. You don't want to um, get it directly on the leaves because they will burn and spot the leaf a bit, but you want to just make sure it's slightly around the soil and it seems to spread. I've never lost plant to dapping off in decades. Well, that's very good to know. Thank you. Just good tip. But that was University of New Hampshire tip. <laughs> Excellent. Lisa wanted to know, did grow lights ever go on sale? Grow lights, um, I have never seen them on sale. However, I have seen shop lights on sale. Um, and if you buy, uh, Janice Gessner's husband was the one who told me this. He said that he buys the daylight bulbs in bulk. So he'll buy a case of them and they come to about $3 a bulb. So that's fabulous. That's, you're not gonna find them any cheaper than that. The grow lights themselves that are fluorescents are not expensive. At Menards, I got mine for $7. So okay. they're, not, they're not that expensive. And Marie, Rachel, yes. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Would those bulbs fit in a bag? So when they have the everything you can fit in the bag, <laughs> sale. Um, I don't know if they would let you qualify that, but I mean they will fit. The bottom of them will fit in the bag. Let's I don't try think it. The whole thing has to be in the bag, but yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Rachel said that Marie. the Grow lights are less expensive than the ones marketed for seed, st seed starting. That, that probably is true, yes. And Marie, is there any, um, any tips for recovering from overwatering? Because I put my little plastic um, cover on top of my Jiffy tray, and then I get these water droplets that are hanging from the plastic. So I tip it up as fast as I can and go to the sink, dump it out, but off my plants then for a couple of days. Any ideas what I can do? Because I inevitably overwater. 
Oh, yes, I'm, you're talking to the wrong lady, I'm afraid. Because okay. I am, a, I am a chronic overwaterer, and I have killed more seedlings, I gotta tell you. I'm getting better. Every year I get a little better at it, but, but I have no feeling in my fingers. And so when I say measure a half inch down, it's very difficult for me to tell if there's water on those or not. And if they look dry, which almost always they do, um, I water them. So this is, this is a problem. I've, I've had the best luck actually with a, a probe to check for the moisture level. And, and so I wish I could help you with that, but I'm not the right person to ask. If anybody else knows the answer or has an idea, we'd be are glad you, to hear it. Are you talking about the plastic dome over the yeah. plastic? Yeah. yeah, you shouldn't have those on after your plants germinate. Yeah, you, those should not be left on after they germinate. That's correct, yes. Yeah, so you leave right. that on until the seeds germinate and once major, uh, majority of the seeds have germinated, you wanna take those off. That's what's going to promote your dampening off and humidity, so you don't want that dome. So just remove those dome, uh, that's the best way. Yeah, so you Thanks, keep, John. So keep the dome on while they're seeds and then once they start coming up, then take them off. Thank you. Can I just add, if it's in a big tray with the plastic that's kind of flexible, the very starter trays, I've totally overwatered those before and I've just kind of squeezed some of the excess water out of like the individual cells. <laughs> and I don't know if that's really helped, but it's made me feel better. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good tip too, I guess. <laughs> Thanks. When I when I was used uh, seed starting, I I always watered from the bottom. Yes, that helps quite a bit, and you let them drain. I've never had any trouble with overwatering that way. That is that is really smart. I yeah. I tend to not do that, and I don't know why because I know this. I know that that's how you're supposed to do it. Um, but yes, you're absolutely right. If you water from the bottom and then don't leave them sitting in the water. Um, you're going to have a lot less problems. Yep. No, I never did. Anything else? Thank you again, Marie. That was that was what we wanted, and let's. I'll make a note to have people sign up for the propagation team as well. Perfect. A lot of us will learn how to do things we didn't know how to do last year. Thanks a lot. That was thank great. you, Marie. Thank you. I We're have one have other. What? I have a one other thing about the uh, watering. I have some from the bottom. I have some pots that I put pebbles in the bottom of a pan and then I put my plants on top of that. So if I do over water, it, it's not going, it's not sitting there in the water. That's, yes, that's a good idea too. And it creates some humidity as well. Yes. Yeah. 